Hi everybody. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Hopefully this is the absolute last time that you see me in this bed. Um, everything is healed up so good. I'm feeling so strong. Um, God is answering our prayers because my, by the time you see this, I will be in the car traveling to my kid's wedding. So the next time we have a video, I will have married children. Is that the craziest thing you've ever heard? I am so excited. Um, today's I am statement is, uh, we're going to look at one of my favorite stories in the Bible. So I'm so excited to get started. So let's pray. Father, I love you so much. Thank you so much for the recovery bed. Lord, sometimes when you ask us to, to kind of lay down for a while, it's because you have a will to complete in us. And I thank you for what you've been able to complete. Now, Father, be with us as we study your word, open it up to us, and let our hearts just be stirred to be dedicated to you, our God. All right, guys, today's I am statement is I am an idol rejecter, okay? Now, I know that sounds kind of like, duh, but it's really, it's really critical that we understand exactly what God is saying. This is one of the... Uh, I want to say this is close to being one of the top I am statements that he uh, requires of us. This idea of being an idol rejecter is absolutely in the very core of a Christian's belief system. It is impossible to maintain a healthy, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ if there is any thing, anyone, any time, any place that sits in a seat higher than God. Now, I think that that is important for us to understand because when we hear the word idol, we think of a statue or an image. And that is not the picture of what God is trying to say. A statue and an, uh, you know, things like that, that is an illustration of that teaching of God. But that is not the core of, of the message of being an idol rejecter. So we are going to look at tons of verses. I pray we get through as many as we can. So it will be fun. Um, we are going to start at the very beginning in Exodus. Now, God is, he's really cool the way he communicates. He has made sure that we have an understanding of pretty much everything he expects from us. He's not like, you know, have you ever been in a relationship? Dating, marriage, or whatever, boss, whatever, friendship. Have you ever been in a relationship where you feel like you never know what that other person wants from you. And so you try really hard to figure it out. And, and you do all these gestures and, and things like that. And, and it's just, it never works. It's like, okay, you didn't want that. You didn't want that. You're trying to read their mind. And it always feels like you can never measure up. I've noticed that a lot of Christians seem to feel that way about God. Um, that they get this idea in their head that they're always trying to please him. They don't know what he wants. They always feel like he's, they're letting him down. And I've known so many people that have really kind of walked away from wanting a deeper relationship with Jesus because they feel like they're letting God down. But that is not what the Bible says. The Bible is so clear. God is so wonderful at telling us, all you have to do is what I've called you to do. Anything outside of that, we don't have to worry about. Let me give you a for instance. And it's, <laughs> um, it's hard when I use this illustration. It's hard on Aaron. Because Aaron is a different man, but we, I knew him before he knew Jesus. And I was in love with him before he knew Jesus. It was very hard because I didn't want to marry him 
I didn't want to be in a marriage where we didn't both serve Jesus. So it was really hard to get through that time. And uh, God was miraculous. And it, my husband bent his knee to Jesus and his whole life was transformed. So all that to say, I'm going to tell you a story about Aaron before he knew Jesus while we were dating. I grew up in a place where I was told every single day, I love you. I love you every morning, every night, and maybe a couple times in between. I love being told that I'm loved. I also love telling other people how much they are loved. I'm sure you kind of figured that out in the way I teach. I, I, you're getting to know me really well. And so at the beginning when we were uh, you know, dating and we were, we were really serious and we were committed, and um, I would tell him I love him every day. When we'd talk on the phone, I love you. We'd say, hello, I love you. We'd say goodbye, I love you. And, and he would say it. But one day he looked at me and he said, could you just stop telling me you love me? Okay. <laughs> if you're a woman, you know exactly what I did. I started sobbing. Um, I, I felt that was rejection. And needless to say, that, that ended up being something that uh, we had to look at in our relationship. Well, as it turned out, when we came to finally figure out, past the tears, past the hurt, past the breakup, past the whole thing, that Aaron didn't know how to handle those words. And so I was trying to do something that I thought he would love, but it wasn't something that he wanted. Have you ever done that in a relationship where you tried to guess what somebody wanted? Thinking for sure, yeah, I'm sure. And then found out, oh, that didn't work out. You never have to worry about that with God. He tells us. And he knows us so well. He knows us so well that he knows exactly how capable we are to live up to what he's called us to be, what he's created us to be, and what he wants us to be. And you know how I know that? Because the Bible says that whatever he calls us to, he will equip us for. Now, I know this is a long introduction that may not seem relevant to this whole idea of I am an idol rejector. But we have to understand, there is no question in what we read today of what God expects from us. And it may be a little more detailed than it sounds by the title. So we are going to look this I am statement. If you do not agree with it or grab a hold of it or live in it, there's going to be a problem in your relationship with God. Okay. So all that to say, Let's find out exactly what God expects from us in this I am statement that he says, I am an idol rejector. And we are going to start, I'm going to drift my glass. Oh, <laughs> silly me. We are going to start in Exodus. Now we are going to look at Exodus chapter 20 and um, you're going to find out in your notes, if you go to Facebook and to Jot and Tittle, you'll get today's worksheet and you're going to find out that there's multiple places in the Old Testament where he says, where he repeats his commandments. So we're just going to look at Exodus and uh, it's in Leviticus. It's in Deuteronomy. It's repeated several times. So we're going to be in Exodus chapter 20 and we're going to read four through six. Okay. This is going to be so familiar for you. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You, not, you shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third, the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, when we memorized commandments, you know, the Ten Commandments when we were kids, 
you know, and, and, and we'd be in Sunday school and you'd, and you'd say the Ten Commandments. It was just a simple, do not have idols. It wasn't all of those other words. It wasn't all of those other sentences. It was, don't have any idols before me. So when we look at how full those verses are, when God is originally giving his expectations, I think everybody knows the Ten Commandments are important to God. It's, it, it, it's from the very beginning of what he set down as his expectations. Now, this is before Jesus came and uh, gave us access to God personally. So God has added a lot more things through Jesus Christ that he wants to give us and he wants to see bloom in us. But bottom line is, this no idols before him is a serious thing. And let's look a little bit about what more he says in there, okay? When he says, you know, you not make yourself an idol. I think that's where we get the idea that idols are only something that you can see like statues and stuff like that. That is not the flavor of this word. This word does represent um, a physical image. So what I get from this, and this is pure Jackie, is that it's something that is earthly. Um, it is something tangible. It is something real. And so when you think about this, this word idol, I want you, as we read more about what God wants and expects, I want you to think about this concept of what does he mean by idol? And start making a list and adding the clues of what God gives us as to what this word idol might be so that we can accurately reject them that we don't want idols a part of our life at all. So let's look at this at, at just a little bit here. It, it says, nothing in the earth. And he covers it from the heavens all the way down to the core of the earth that we don't even know. He says, there is absolutely nothing in the heavens or down to the bottom of the ocean. Nothing on this earth from top to bottom and everything in between. There is absolutely nothing on this earth that we can emulate, put in a high priority, to place in positions that are higher than God. Even if you are not a Christian, there is still absolutely nothing on this earth or in the heavens above that can equal God. And he gives us no room. If we, re he gives us no room, top to bottom, anything on this earth, no matter what form it's in, we cannot put it in a place that has more love or more admiration or more authority, influence, or control in our life than God. Now that's pretty clear. But he goes on to say, guys, you need to take this super serious because if you do not live up to this, if you do not grab a hold of the understanding of this, he says, oh, this is really scary that if we engage in this idol idol worshiping worshiping in this sense means and and worshiping in other places in the bible talking about god has the same flavor it's this all encompassing it's a physical spiritual mental emotional devotion and god is saying if you are putting that if you're projecting that this is what's going to happen if you're not projecting that on god he says, he will visit this sin. He will, he will continually remind us of this sin in our life. If we don't stop, the consequences of this will fall not only on us, but our children. It says on our children, on the next children, on the next children, and the next children. Oh, Four generations of children can feel the heavy, awful effects, the separation from God, because I have something in my life that I put higher than God. 
Okay, guys, I don't know if you're understanding, but this is so serious. God is helping us understand there is absolutely zero wiggle room in this expectation. God takes this so seriously that he warns us that this behavior has such severe consequences that our children will feel them. Now that sounds awful. God's going to punish my kids because I don't believe in him. It's not as simple as that. You see, the consequences of placing your heart and your devotion onto something, someone, someplace, other than God, so affects our ability to be close and intimate with him, that our children will be affected by that. We'll see that, might even copy that. And that can screw up generations of kids. Um, I think you know what I do, what I, well, what I used to do for a living, now I'm retired. I worked a lot with people who had uh, some very serious issues. And I worked with a lot of people who had abuse in their life in various forms. I also worked with people who had various addictions in their life. And one of the things that, that we came to understand, and, and, and really all of you have probably heard it before, that although it's not hereditary, there are some things that travel through generations that don't necessarily have a scientific proof to them like addictive behavior. They have found that if you have a family member that has an addiction, your chances of having an addiction suddenly get higher. Now they have studied that for years and years and years and science has said, yep, absolutely, there's a correlation. But they haven't been able to find necessarily a, a, a chemical reason or, or, or a scientific reason of why that happens. They have just discovered that it does. The same with abuse. If there is abuse in the family, there is a higher tendency for abuse to happen in the next generation. So this idea is not something new. We all have heard about this before. So that's what's God, what God is trying to say. That there are some things, there are some sins that have such an impact on our lives that they can influence generations to come. And so he's warning us, please, please don't bring idols. Don't bring this concept that there is anything higher than me into your life because it increases the generations after you to do the same. That make a little more sense? As you read Leviticus and Deuteronomy, I think you'll have a better understanding that God is not being mean, but he is, he is calling us to this beautiful place where we can be as close to him as close can get. All right, we're going to flip over and I want you to see this amazing story in the Bible. So we're going to see where God, you know, there's lots of places where God says, do not worship idols. And in the New Testament, we're going to see that Jesus did the same thing. And we're going to see in the New Testament that the early church was established with the same thing. This rule, this expectation, this core belief has never, ever changed. It has stayed the same and it has stayed as serious. We probably will not get to, to look at Revelation today, but we just read the beginning. And in Revelation, there's a verse in the very end about idol worshiping. So this whole idea of idol goes all the way through. Okay, so, but we're gonna take a break for a minute and we're gonna read an illustration. And this illustration really, if you read this and you believe that this story is true and that this story really happened, then it's gonna be a little bit easier to process this concept of why God is asking us to not have anything else that we worship. So let's go really quickly. We're going to go to 1 Samuel. 
And I, let me just set up what is happening in here. Okay. This is when uh, kingship, so to say, has first been established. Israel has decided they no longer want God. Now, I want you to listen to this time in history. They have decided that they no longer want God as their top leader because everybody around them had kings. They wanted to be like everybody else and get a king. Now, there's nothing, please don't confuse this. There's nothing wrong with having leaders of a country. We're not talking about, oh, don't serve any presidents or queens or kings or, you know. No, this is not a stance. This is, I'm giving you the history of what happened to Israel. And so God kind of warned them. And he's like, guys, I'll give you what you want. I thought I was pretty doing pretty good at leading you. But if you want something on this earth to lead you, okay. But let me help you find the people on earth to help you. Now, at this time in history, the people knew the people were in a good position, so to speak. Um, they were already a nation. They already had a had a beautiful piece of land. They they had already kind of become settled. They had they had become a unit. They were no longer wandering. And David becomes a character that we learn about later in this portion. He's not yet king, but he's in. Um, they're in positions where. They're trying to teach the other people around, well, God is trying to teach the other countries around them that there is no other God more powerful than Israel's God. So this happens in, in front of not only the nation of Israel, but the nations around. And so this historical event set the stage for the whole world to understand how big the God of Israel was. All the other places had all sorts of gods that they prayed to, served, worshipped, and God does this. All right, go to chapter 5 of 1 Samuel, and we are going to read, well, it's such a beautiful story, but we can't, we can't read it all on here. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. Now, the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Now, let me explain that for a second. The Ark of the Covenant is the same thing that is talked about in Exodus. That holds when Moses, okay, when Moses was leading them in the wilderness and they had a tabernacle and God told them what to do to worship and all that was established, there was also this Ark of Covenant and in it had some of the proof of the things that God had done for their history. So this Ark became a physical symbol of all the power and the incredibleness of the God that the nation of Israel served. And so this Ark became just a symbol and God showed how powerful he was through this ark. Now that may sound silly, but let's keep going. And so the Philistines, we've already heard of them. Remember, that's where Goliath came. Goliath was a Philistine. And these Philistines hated the Israelites. And they hated the Israelites' God. And so they had won victories over, over Israel. And they stole the ark. And the ark ended up traveling all over these places because they knew that there was something so powerful about the nation of Israel that they thought that if they could steal the ark, then they could take away their God's power and win. Nothing could take away God's power. And so this ark just keeps traveling around as people keep conquering Israel. And so let's keep reading. Then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Dagon was one of the most uh, most common gods that was, that was served in ancient East during biblical times. I'm gonna, this is a wonderful time to do a little bit of searching 
It's not hard. Just put in the word Dagon of Israel's uh, in Israel's history, and they're going to tell you what this God looked like, what he represented, and how many countries worship this God. But there was a statue, and I'm not talking a little one. I'm talking ginormous. And an entire temple that was built for this false god, Dagon. And it, if the Philistines, this was one of the Philistines' most primary gods. And so they put the symbol of Israel's most primary god, the only god, and they put it in the temple of their god, Dagon. Oh, buddy, they didn't know what they were getting into. When the Ashadites arose early the next morning. Behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and they set him back up in his place again. Can you imagine? This first time probably wasn't that big of a deal except a lot of hard work. I mean, we're talking it, please go look up Dagon because it's hilarious. This was a big God. And to come in and find it on its face, it's not like, oh, the lamp fell over or a little, you know, ceramic statue fell to the ground. We're talking ginormous. That stuff doesn't fall. It can't even be pushed. But they come in and he's on his face. I can't imagine how hard it was for them to be able to put it back up in place, but they did. Now, at that point, they're probably thinking, oh, no coincidence. But I want you to read the rest. Okay, here we go. But when, sorry. Yes, they put it back. We're in verse four. But when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And this time, not only did it fall, but this time the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left in him. I so love this. I'm going to throw in verse 5. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor all who entered Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. Now, I know I'm laughing, and it's probably not a laughing matter, but they come back in to serve their God and, and, and put you know sacrifices before their God and put offerings on his altar the second day, and all of a sudden, they not only find that their God has fallen on his face, but his head got knocked off and his hands got knocked off and they rolled or, or moved to the threshold of the door. The threshold is when you walk into the temple. So I want you to think about how crazy this is. Now, I, I would love to finish the story for you, but hopefully I've piqued your interest and you understand, oh my goodness, I want to go study this. But God was showing the people of Israel and everybody around him, that there is no God, there is no God that can stand equally toe to toe against the creator of the universe. Now that may be silly to talk about because we don't have these great big statues in our churches. Well, that's not true. Some people do. But as Christ followers, we understand that God is number one. And sending his son Jesus, he made his son Jesus number one as well. And he is teaching us that there are other nations, there are other peoples. I'm just going to be a minute, buddy. Oh, thank you for shutting that door. Um, and that there are other things that people believe in. We might even believe it. And God is teaching that there is nothing else. So I want you to do, please do some, some work with this. I know we're running out of time. I'm going to jump to Micah. And we're just going to read a couple verses here. And, and, and I'm going to jump to a couple just in case you don't get to do the worksheet. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let's look up at, at Micah 5. We're going to look through 1315. I'm not going to give you any history. 
We're, um, I don't know if we've, we've done Micah yet together, but we're going to do Micah and Habakkuk today. Uh, we only have a, a few books left that we haven't that we haven't found something from. I'm going to read it to you, and I want you to go back and, and look at the history because we're so out of time. This is God speaking first person through the prophet Micah to his people, to the people of Israel. And this is what God says. I will root out your ashram from among you and destroy your cities. I will execute vengeance in anger and wrath on the nations which not have not obeyed. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry, I forgot to move up to verse 13. It starts at verse 13. I will cut off your carved images and your sacred pillars from among you so that you will no longer bow down to the work of your hands. What had happened is Israel had been influenced. And they had started bringing other things into their belief system. They began to compromise the truth of what God was asking. Now here's where we get where we can probably relate. The gospel is just pure. It can't be watered down. It can't be added to and it can't have anything taken away from it. The gospel is really simply simple. There is one God. He sent his beautiful one son one Messiah, one Holy Spirit, one Bible. That's what we follow. Very simple. Nothing else. But for some reason, followers of God and followers of Christ, we like to try to add a little things that might make our belief system seem easier. God told his people in Micah, Hey, you're starting to compromise and you're starting to believe that other things might have power or priority. And he warns us and he says, guys, I'm going to knock them down. Anything in your life, I'm going to start knocking it down if you continue to put that in my place. Let's keep going. We're going to look at Habakkuk really quickly. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. And again, we're in the, a very similar situation. It's not the same, same time period. But once again, this is first person God speaking through the mouth of the prophet Habakkuk. And this is what he is saying to his nation. Verses 18 through 20. What prophet is the idol when its maker has carved it? Or an image, a teacher of falsehood? For its maker trusts in his own handiwork. When he fashions speechless idols, woe to him who says to a piece of wood, wake up, and to a dumb stone says, arise, and that is our teacher. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and with silver, and there's no breath at it at all. There's no breath at all inside it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let the earth be silent before him. Now, I want you to understand that I love that passage of scripture because you can hear the sarcasm of God just dripping off of it. He's like, seriously, guys, come on. We've been through this so many times. I love you so much. I want to be close to you. And you keep with your own hands, you keep making things and producing things that you are making. And you think that somehow that's more powerful than me. Are you guys crazy? Can you bring life into anything? How can you go to something and say, I made this and then put it in a place of priority when it was made by human hands? Now, this is where I get a little uh, opinionated because on this earth, man made technology, man made televisions, man made computers. We can't breathe, breathe life into those. Man, you know, man seems to think that we have gotten so smart that we've outsmart God and that those things become, well, that's smarter. And so we start bringing idols in that we didn't even know or think about as idols in our life. We've come up with so many pastime things that we've created. Not thinking, hey, we made those. God, you know, we think those are higher than God. So you see, there's things that we have in our life that aren't necessarily statues. But we give them the credit of being made by, a, by, a, by God of the universe, and they're not. So just by that right and that right alone, everything.
everything is superior. It doesn't matter how smart man gets, how, how, how big we get. God is always bigger. And he needs us as his followers to understand he is always bigger. There is nothing. All right, I know if you'll just give me another two minutes, I'm just going to read you two more verses so that you can see this in the New Testament. Let's go to uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 10. And we're just going to look at um, verse 7 and verse 14. We're not going to explain it. Verse 7. Now, this is in the early church. Paul's writing this to the church. Jesus has already established the church. Jesus in the Gospels has already told them, don't worship idols. He gives them lots of illustrations. You can go look at all of those. It's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. This verse says, and do not be idolaters as, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally, it, sorry, immorally as some of them did. I want you to understand this verse helps us understand the New Testament. He says, don't become idolaters. And then he quotes something from the Old Testament that doesn't seem to make sense at fitting in with this concept of idling. He said they would go sit and eat and drink and play. Are you getting a better sense that idols are not just statues? Do you see that that Paul is quoting from the Old Testament? Guys, they spent so much time celebrating and playing and worshiping and drinking to other things that they forgot that God was bigger. And all of a sudden, other things crept into their life that they placed bigger than God. And so Paul is telling them, it's not bowing down to a statue that's idol worship. It is putting everything or anything at a higher priority. So God is defining what he means by, by rejecting idols very clearly. There's no guessing. Okay, now let's flip over to 1 John and we'll finish. I'm so sorry this was longer. We'll finish right here. 1 John chapter 5, verse 21. I love this. It's so simple and it's not babyish. This is John talking who walked with Jesus, who sat with Jesus, who was loved by Jesus, who experienced everything, the good, the bad, the ugly with Jesus, and then spent his life living for Jesus after Jesus went to heaven. He established the church and he so loves the church. And this is how he ends this is his final sentence in this book that he has written to the church. And he says, little children, guard yourselves from idols. That is the message that God and Jesus, the Holy Spirit and the Bible are laying down as a main foundation for us as Christians. Don't. Don't fall into the trap of idols. Revelation says at the end, when judgment comes and we stand before God, it specifically says those who have placed idols in their life will not be able to spend eternity with me. Guys, this is a very critical, serious I am statement. Evaluate. Is there anything you've placed before God? Is there anything that you've put? <laughs> you know what? I'm going to give you a challenge. If you can think of anything in your life that might have a little bit more importance than God, or that you think might be maybe a little bit powerful than God. It's funny because I hear Christians who would say, I'm an idol rejecter, but I hear them constantly say, oh, the devil did that, or the devil did that. I'm sorry, but the devil does not have higher power than God. So if you're giving the devil all the credit for this, you might need to check if you think the devil is a little bit more strong or more powerful or more or more frightening than God. So there's a lot of Christians who actually have devil as, as, as their idol because they think he might be more powerful and they give him credit for things. The devil's not doing everything. The devil can't do anything that God doesn't say he can. So, you know, even down to giving, hey, the devil did that. Uh, let's look at what God did first. Or what God is going to do before we start giving, throwing the devil some, some kudos for being more powerful. Now, the challenge I'm going to give you is if there is something that God has brought into your, to your thoughts or your mind right now that says, oh, that might be an idol. 
I want you to set it next to God, kind of like the story we did in 1 Samuel, and see what God can do to show you. There is nothing that you can set next to him that is more powerful than him. I love you guys so much. I'm sorry this was rushed, but this is one of the deepest, most important I am statements we can cover. I love you so much.